today's bible discussion god bless you so much i really welcome all of you to today's bible discussion and uh, last week we studied about hebrew chapter 9 last two weeks and last three weeks we were on chapter 8 and there's one specific thing god was actually emphasizing and telling us every time that is he says he has forgiven us all our sins god is trying to demonstrate a deep root love towards us he wants us to understand the volume the depth of the love that he has for us so he further explained he further promised us that our sins our iniquities our lawless deeds he will remember no more he will remember no more so god has been so faithful to us in chapter 9 last week one major thing that we hammered on was in verse 22 uh, which which um, tells us that without shedding of blood there is no remission of sins without shedding of blood so this also explained that our forgiveness the forgiveness that god is talking about today is not simply because he decided just to forgive us because we cry to him or because we pray to him or because we do something nice that pleases him no simply because someone has shed his blood on the cross of Calvary. Jesus has shed his precious blood on our behalf. And the, because of this, our sins have been remitted. Our sins have been forgiven. And once and for all, he says, once and for all, which means that he's not going to come back again and forgive anybody any sin again. He has done it once for the time being for the rest of the ages to come for the rest of our lives here on earth he has forgiven us he has cleansed us from all our sins hallelujah this is a great 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 message god is trying to speak to us every time so this is one thing if you cannot remember anything in his word understand that he loves you understand that he has cleansed you understand that he has forgiven you all your sins all your past all your present and all your future sins god has forgiven you all of them so all you have to do as a child of god is to hold on to him cling on to him keep believing and keep believing and keep believing in the blood of jesus in the name of jesus and he will take care of the rest of the things in your life all the bad chapters in your life he himself he will work on them and he will make sure that he perfect you you cannot perfect your own self he is the one who is doing the perfection and he will complete it hallelujah so today we are continuing from chapter 10 hebrew chapter 10 verse one hebrew chapter 10 verse 1 says for the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect god is telling us in chapter one that the law is just a shadow and we kept saying this every day every time we meet we keep saying that the law is a shadow it's not the reality so all the laws including the ten commandments including all the laws the mosaic laws you find in the old testament all of them god is saying that they are just shadows they are just to hold us they are just pointing to something they are pointing to somebody the reality is christ jesus and the shadow can never by any means cleanse us from all our sins it can never by any means cleanse us from our conscience 
It's just a shadow. So God wanted the children of Israel to cling on to that shadow gradually until the reality comes for the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. Verse 2 For then would they not have ceased to be offered for the worshippers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins for the worshippers if the law were uh, was able to perfect the conscience of man was able to cleanse man was able to remit sin if the sacrifices that they were making year after year the high priest have been making year after year if it were not just pointing to Jesus Christ, if it were just uh, indeed able to, to remit sins and cleanse the people from their sins, then they would have ceased from offering those sacrifices. But every year, they keep offering those sacrifices year after year, day after day signifying that the reality has not come the main the main cause of the sacrifice the root has not been dealt with the reason they are doing the sacrifices is not achieved so every year they keep offering those sacrifices year after year which were not able to cleanse them from their sins verse 3 says verse 3 and 4 but in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins it is not possible once god says it is not possible it is not possible that the blood of good the blood of bulls and the blood of goats could take away anyone's sins so why do they practice those things in the past why do they kill animals in the past you know the bible says that the wages of sin is death but god has been so gracious and so merciful to man that any man that sins anyone who sins supposed to die but god because god is a merciful god he designed that that once a man sins or at the end of a year they bring a lamp or they bring a goat or a bull and then the high priest lay his hands upon the 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 head of the goat or the head of the animal then he confesses uh, his sins and the sins of the children of Israel unto the 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 the, 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 the lamp unto the head of the lamp then the lamb is slaughtered because one you supposed to die i supposed to die or those children of israel they supposed to die for their sins god decided that the sins should be should be uh, transferred into such animal into that lamb so that the lamb would die instead of the man who committed the sin god has been so merciful and that is just a shadow that they have been practicing year after year day by day which were not able to take away their sins but god had it in mind that one day he himself will come in the form of man to cleanse man permanently to cleanse man perfectly to wash man uh, perfectly from his sins and indeed he has done it so today when we keep saying that god has forgiven you all your sins god has forgiven you your past your present your future sins you should not have any doubts about that you shouldn't have any agitation in your mind about that it is because of what christ has done it is because of the 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 the, the sacrificial work the 
perfect work that he has done for us and that is why today he is still emphasizing and telling us in verse 4 that for it is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins so if the blood of bulls and goats were not able to take away sins it took only the blood of jesus christ to cleanse us to take away all our sins and once and for all he has done it verse 5 christ's death fulfills god's will that's the heading therefore when he came into the world he said sacrifice and offering you did not desire but a body you have prepared for me you can get that from psalm 40 verse 6 and then psalm 50 verse 8 you get that if you open to isaiah chapter 1 verse 11 to you get a similar thing and that is what he has said verse 6 in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure then Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do your will, O God. And this is all about Jesus Christ. Behold, Jesus has come to do the will of God. He has come in the volume of the book that is written about, about him. Remember, the entire Bible is pointing to somebody jesus christ so everything we read in the bible we try to figure somebody out of that if you cannot figure jesus out of it if it is all about the beauty of esther and you cannot find jesus in it you may be in error if it is all about the the stars of aaron and you can't find christ over there you may be in error if your preaching is all about the beer of moses and you cannot find christ out of this then you are you are landing in error so everything most things written about uh, inside this bible all the characters we see in the bible mostly are pointing to jesus christ they are personifying somebody jesus christ they are talking about somebody jesus christ they are all pointing to jesus christ so if our message can all point to jesus christ i believe that christianity will be the same everywhere you can go to any place and walk to any any worship center, any church temple and worship God and have the same word preached to you, not differ from what you heard from your, your former place. We can all just go to any place and listen to the right word of God. But it's rather unfortunately, most at times, people focus the word onto themselves, onto material things, onto things that are not relating to salvation, things that are not pointing to Jesus Christ. But remember, behold, he has come in the volume of the book it is written of him. Verse 8, previously saying, sacrifices and offering, uh, offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire nor had pleasure in them which are offered according to the law you can get that from psalm 51 david said bent of uh, sacrifices and offerings you desire not so god is saying those things no he doesn't really desire in those things so who are they actually uh, 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 performing practicing those things to the bent offerings who are they practicing them to who are they offering them to god say he doesn't rejoice in those things he doesn't desire in those things verse 9 then he said behold i have come to do your will the will of god the will of god is the best thing is the only thing god desires in 
I've come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. He takes away the first, the first testament, the old covenant that we have. He took it away in order to establish the new covenant, which is perfect, who, which is glorious, which is full of grace to us. Verse 10, by that will, this will, the will here is talking about the covenant. It's talking about the testament. So he's saying, by that testament, because verse 9 says he took away the first testament and he established the second testament. So because of that testament, because of this second testament, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Because of this testament, this new testament, this is how it has emerged. He has offered himself in place of those lambs, in place of uh, those goats, in place of those bulls that they have been offering year after year, which we, we first saw in verse 1 as a shadow. He himself has come. The reality has come to replace those things that they have been practicing, the shadows that they have been practicing in the Old Testament. So in the New Testament, we do not practice those sacrifices again. We do not perform those offerings again. Jesus Christ, by his own body, by his own blood, has sanctified us through this will through this testament how many times 10 times no 20 times no a thousand times no once and for all jesus has spared us once and for all he has cleansed us once and for all which means that there is no cleansing again for a child of god Apart from what Jesus has done, he has done it once and for all. There's no better cleansing again you are going to do again. Nobody is going to fetch water down again and say, come and bath in it before you be cleansed. No. Nobody is going to fetch anointing oil down and say, come and tap into it before you be cleansed. No. He has cleansed us. He has spared us. He has sanctified us. To be sanctified means to be made holy. He has made us holy once and for all. So today, as a child of God, you are holy. You are righteous. You are perfect. You are sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ once and for all. And one thing we need to understand so that the agitation will stop is that it is not by the works we are doing that sanctifies us. It is not the things that we are doing that makes us holy, but we are made holy by the will which Jesus, with his own body, with his own blood, has made for us. Verse 11. Christ's death perfect the sanctified the sanctified the death of jesus christ has perfected the sanctified and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins which can never take away sins which can never Take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his fools too. For by this, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified.
for by one offering he has perfected forever. Jesus has perfected us forever and ever. Forever. Forever means everlasting. Forever means it has no time bound. Forever means there's nothing more you are going to do to perfect it again. He has perfected me forever and ever. He has perfected you also forever and ever. And this is what Jesus is telling us. For by one offering, that one offering that has happened on the cross of Calvary over 2,000 years ago, by that same offering, that one offering, he has perfected us forever. It is not today that we go to the temple and the pastor or whoever who is leading the prayer topics tells you that pray for your sins, that God will forgive you your sins. That is not when God has perfected you. No. It is not when you are crying over your sins and you look back and all the atrocities you have committed, they are in front of you and then you are looking at them and you feel bad about them and then you begin to cry, you begin to hit your head against the, the wall, you begin to roll on the ground. That is not when God has perfected you. That is not when God has cleansed you from your sins. He has done it once and for all by that one sacrifice. The perfection has been made. He had you in mind. He had me in mind when going on the cross over 2,000 years ago. He's the omniscient God. He's the God who sees the end from the beginning. He's the God who stands beyond time. Who doesn't dwell in time. We are dwelling in time here. He is beyond time. He dwells in a place where there's no time. And he has perfected us once and for all. So even at the time when you were not born, he is still looking at you. He is still seeing you in the world. In your great, 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 great grandparents' loins, you were there. He still sees you. And he made this perfection once and for all. This is nearly too good to be truth. But indeed, this is the truth. But the Holy Spirit also witnessed to us, for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. We explained this last two weeks, and even last two week. And this is the menu of the new covenant that Jesus has established in his own blood, by his own body, by his own blood. This is the new covenant. This is the, the, the benefits that we receive. We the beneficiaries, this is what we receive. That he will put his law into our hearts. The perfect law of liberty, unlike the Old Testament law, thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not. No. This one, when Jesus came, he said, thou shalt, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He puts his laws into our hearts and in their minds, I will write them. So today, all of us, who are in the Christendom, who believe in Christ, who understand the scriptures, the New Testament scriptures, we understand one thing. God loves us. And he demands that love that we also love our neighbors. We love God and we love our neighbors. And Jesus specifically told us that in this one law, Oh, the 613 laws that we have in the, in the Bible, all of them were embedded in this one law. Love your neighbor 
as yourself. Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. That word love contains all the law. So if you will love somebody, if you can love your neighbor, if you can love people you see around, if you can love them, you have fulfilled all the law. And this is the main reason God himself decided <clears throat> to show us the way. In our world today, we say leadership by example. So God decided to demonstrate his love for, to us, towards us first. And he decided to love us unconditionally. And he sees that you are making a mistake. He sees that you are still going to make a mistake tomorrow. And you are still not going to be uh, physically perfect in this flesh. But he says, your sins, your iniquities will I remember no more. He says, I still see you perfect. I still see you sanctified. I am the one who sanctified you. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are. This is all God is saying about us. You are a holy nation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a peculiar person to God. He sees you like that. Why do you then see yourself differently? Why then do you allow somebody who doesn't know you, somebody who doesn't create you, to tell you a different person who you are not, to describe you differently, that you are a thief, you are a fornicator, you are this, uh, pray, to, pray to God, cry to God, and do this and do that. Why do you allow others to describe who you are not? God is saying, this is whom I have made you to be. This is who you are now. This is your new nature. As he is, so are we in this world. So are we in this world. As Jesus is, so are we in this world. He has perfected us so that we, he who sanctifies, and they that have been sanctified, they have become one. So for that matter, he is not ashamed to call us brethren. So we have just become like Jesus Christ. As he is, so are we right now. This one looks so crazy to somebody who doesn't understand God's love. Who is still focusing on law. This looks so crazy to him to understand that he's just like Jesus Christ. The way he is, he has made you also to be so. And this is how you are. And so shall you be forever and ever. Verse 17. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Their sins, their lawless deeds I will remember no more. God chose to remember our sins, our lawless deeds no more. Because of what Christ has done. So, we dare not go to his presence trying to remind him again about our sins, about our lawless deeds, thinking that we are pleading for mercy. No, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Their sins, their lawless deeds, will I remember no more. That sins you think you have committed, he said he will be merciful unto them and he will remember them no more. Because of how fulfilled he is by the, 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 the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, where there is remission of, of this, there is no longer an offering for sins. Now, where there is remission of this, there is no longer an offering for sin. Now today, the kind of offering for sins we have, we have also graduated. At some point, we have graduated. We are no more using animals and things. The, the, the last time I was watching some prophet who says that everybody should come. During this Christmas time, everybody should come. They are going to kill a, a, a very big cow. 
they are just going to put a knife into uh, his throat and then they allow the cow to be moving and be moving and be dangling so that uh, wherever it goes to, dang, uh, to, to die, it will keep dangling and be spreading the blood through the throat so, so uh, until it falls and died. Then your sins are forgiven. I say hallelujah. This is a great deception. There's no more sacrifice. There's no more offering for sins. There's no more going to God again. Begging him, rolling on the ground, hitting your head against the wall, asking for forgiveness again. When you sin next time, thank God that he has forgiven you all your sins. So when next you make a mistake, say, Lord, I thank you for forgiving me all my sins. And I thank you that you will remember my sins and my lawless deeds no more. This is the best way we need to approach God. That tells us that we understand the scriptures. That tells us that, oh, truly, what our Lord Jesus did for us, we really value it. But when we follow people who... Who are still slaughtering cow for our sins it undermines the sacrifice of Jesus Christ it paints a picture as if the work that Jesus has done for us is not perfect enough we still have to do something we still have to do some offering we still have to kill some animal we still have to hit our our head against the wall we still have to do some penance in order to pay for our own sins But that is not what the scripture tells us. So let's continue to grow in the scriptures. Let's continue to grow in the word. So the word will enlighten us that wherever we are, we will not succumb to such kind of deception. God is saying that now where there is remission of this, there is no more an offering for sin. There's no longer an offering for sin. So there's no way anybody should call you again. Bring a dove, bring a goat, bring a lamp, bring a, a, a sheep so that we, 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 we do uh, an offering to pay for your sin. There is no more offering. Nobody should tell you again that because of what you have done, you, have, you are not cleansed. So you don't have to enter the temple. Hey, God has perfected you. Who is that man who, who, after God has perfected you, who will make you perfect again? No. Verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrate, consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water so therefore because of all this because of what he has done for us. Because of the perfect work he has done in the spirit for us. Let's now live it in the flesh. Let's now demonstrate it. Let's show it publicly to the world. Let the world see that this is what has happened in us. This is the miracle, the greatest miracle of salvation that God has done in us let's demonstrate it let our hearts be cleansed from evil and not only that from evil conscience as well sometimes some of this evil conscience could just be a conscience of non-forgiveness a conscience that somebody may may have and things that he still as his sins are still holding God has, hasn't forgiven him his sins yet until he has gone to his uh, 
papa, his pope, or his pastor to confess it, and the pastor lays hands on him, his sins have not been forgiven. No. Let's have our conscience cleansed because of what Christ has done. Let's allow the word, the word of God, to cleanse us. Let us hold fast the confession of our, our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. God who promised is faithful. God who says he will forgive. He will, he will remember your sins no more. He is faithful. So let's hold our confession. Our confession in Christ Jesus. Our faith in Christ Jesus. Let's hold it firm. Let us not waver. Let us not allow our faith to wobble. Let us not allow it to shake. Let it stand firm as the Mount Zion. Verse 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhort exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the, the day approaching. Let us not forsake the assembling as we have gathered like this. It is so good that we keep renewing ourselves. We keep renewing our mind every day with the word of God. So if today you can spend just one hour, 30 minutes, in the house of God, just in this meeting, in this Bible studies from 4 o'clock to 5.30, just to, to, to renew your mind with the word of God. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves. Let us not forsake the assembling of the saints. <clears throat> For if we sin willfully, verse 26, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, indignation which will devour the adversaries. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, most of the times some people may think that this is talking to somebody who believed. No. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, if you receive the knowledge of the truth, if the knowledge of the truth has been preached to you, if the gospel has been preached to you and you, you, you have been enlightened, you know the word, that alone does not make you safe. It doesn't mean you are safe. If you just receive the knowledge of the truth, the truth can be preached to somebody, but it's, it is left with the person to now receive Christ as his Lord and his Savior. Until you receive Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, you can, you can be exposed to the truth. You can have the knowledge of the word, the good word of God, the gospel preached to you, the grace of God, the good news. So, I would choose to say, if, for if, Somebody disbelief willfully if after the, you have been exposed to the word of God, after the word has been preached to you 
and you did not believe, you decided after you knowing all the truth, you willfully decide not to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior. God here is saying, no, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. There's nothing like that going to happen again. Jesus is not going to come back again and tell you that, oh, because you did you disbelieve, so I'm coming back again to sacrifice for your sins. Or you are going yourself again to go for that bulls and goats, and then that is actually going to amount to, to something in your life. No. God is saying, if you disbelieve, willfully after being exposed to this grace after being exposed to the word of god there is no other sacrifice of sins but what waits what expects what the only thing that you should expect or the only thing that remains is the judgment the expectation of judgment that awaits the enemy, the adversary. Verse 28 says, Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will, will he be thought worthy who has trampled the, the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. This is actually trying to just oppose the Old Testament law and the grace that we have in Christ Jesus. It's trying to say that even in the Old Testament, when someone rejects the law of Moses, the Mosaic law, if someone rejects that law, on the account of two or three witnesses, the person dies. So how much more? Looking at all the sacrifice that Jesus has done for us, and then you rejected it and you trample it underfoot. How much more punishment do you think awaits you? That is all the scripture is saying. It's trying to compare what happens in the Old Testament. You can imagine in the Old Testament all the atrocity that happens. Imagine somebody picks firewood on the Sabbath day. And God commanded that that person be stoned to death. You can imagine somebody just out of, out of a good heart. Touching a covenant act to prevent it from falling. Then God decides that. Or the Bible says God strike him to death. God smote him. And he died instantly you can imagine all those things that happen so here the bible is saying the writer of hebrew is saying that anyone who has rejected moses law dies without mercy all those things happen in the old testament people die mercilessly because of rejecting the law because of disobeying the law how much more if you reject the grace that Jesus has given to you? If you reject the forgiveness that Jesus has given to you? If you reject the new covenant that Jesus has done in his own blood and has cleansed you once and for all? If you reject that, how much more punishment do you think awaits you? Sometimes when we look at the Old Testament or when we look at Genesis, something happened there in Noah's Ark. When the whole world was destroyed, the whole world was destroyed. 
because of sin. And God chose only one family. God chose Noah and his family. Noah and his children. Those who are already in the ark. All those who entered the ark, they are the ones who could be saved. They are the only ones who have been saved. That is suggesting to us that now, if now, if we decide not to enter into the ark, the ark is actually representing Jesus Christ. If you fail to accept him as your Lord and your Savior, if you fail to enter into that covenant, to be a beneficiary, to benefit from his covenant, at the last end, you are also going to be destroyed. You are also going to be destroyed like how it happened in Genesis, in the beginning. All those things, they are typologies, they are types and shadows that Jesus or the Bible was pointing to us. Verse 30. For we know. For we know him who said. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. Says the Lord. And again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing. To fall into the hands. Of the living God. Now remember all these things. Is talking to somebody. Who refused. To accept the offer. Of Jesus Christ. They were all talking about somebody who fails. To receive Jesus as his Lord and his Savior. Not to somebody who makes a mistake as a child of God. No. Not to somebody who makes a mistake as a child of God. No. That is not what he's saying. Now let's continue. Verse verse 32. But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with suffering, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproach, reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. Verse 34, For you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promises. The promise for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will tarry, will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So to, to crown everything, to crown everything up, God is trying to tell us that if you receive Jesus as your Lord, as your Savior, you don't have to draw back. You don't have to lose focus. You don't have to draw back in faith. Keep believing. Faith, faith is what makes you, brings you into the Christian fold makes you start your Christian journey. So the same faith has to continue with you and end with you. So just believe. Believe in Jesus Christ today and keep believing tomorrow and keep believing forever. I pray that the grace of God empower all of us 
that we will hold firm, we will hold fast what we have believed in, that our faith will not stumble, our faith will never shake, and we will continue to believe till the end. May the Lord strengthen us forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. Um, I thank all of you for, for the patience and uh, for being with us till now.